Hey folks, in this video we're going to explore determinants of linear maps. This is my second video on determinants and builds upon my first video which covers the relationship between determinants and the geometrical notion of volume. If you haven't seen it, be sure to check it out. In that video we saw that determinants measure n-dimensional oriented volume, at least over the real numbers, although this intuition is still useful in guiding us to correct results even in more general cases. We also discovered a fundamental relationship between n-dimensional volume and n plus one-dimensional volume. Namely, that in a certain sense, which we made precise, n-dimensional volume is just n plus one-dimensional volume measured relative to a fixed vector. This simple geometric fact explains important properties of determinants. Let's now get started by defining the determinant of a linear map. Let V be an n-dimensional vector space over the field F. Let delta be a non-zero n-dimensional determinant function on V. If phi is a linear transformation of V, define delta phi from Vn to F by delta phi of x1 to xn equals delta of phi x1 to phi xn. Notice that delta phi is multilinear and alternating. So delta phi is a determinant function. By the universal property of delta, we therefore know that delta phi equals alpha times delta for a unique scalar alpha, which depends only on phi. This leads us to our definition. The determinant of the linear transformation phi is the scalar denoted by det phi, satisfying delta of phi x1 to phi xn equals det phi times delta of x1 to xn for all vectors x1 to xn. Intuitively, det phi is just the factor by which phi scales n-dimensional oriented volume. In particular, if delta of x1 to xn equals 1, then det phi equals delta of phi x1 to phi xn. We note here that det is itself a function. It takes a linear transformation as input and returns a scalar as output. It's called the determinant function. However, it's important to distinguish this function from the determinant function delta, which takes vectors as inputs. These two functions are related by the definition given here. As an example to help visualize the determinant, let E1 and E2 be the standard basis vectors in the plane R2. Then the determinant of a linear transformation phi on the plane is just the oriented area of the parallelogram determined by the vectors phi E1 and phi E2, as seen here. We now examine some basic properties. Since delta of alpha x1 to alpha xn equals alpha to the n times delta of x1 to xn by multilinearity of delta, it follows that the determinant of alpha times the identity transformation iota equals alpha to the n. In particular, the determinant of the identity transformation is 1. This all intuitively makes sense thinking of the determinant as an n-dimensional volume scaling factor. Note that the determinant of the sum of two linear transformations is not in general equal to the sum of the determinants. These properties both show that the function det is not linear. It's important to be mindful of this when working with it. Recall from the previous video that delta determines linear independence. More precisely, delta of x1 to xn is non-zero if and only if the vectors x1 to xn are linearly independent. This leads to an important theorem. A linear transformation phi is invertible if and only if its determinant, det phi, is non-zero. Indeed, since delta of phi x1 to phi xn equals det phi times delta of x1 to xn for all vectors x1 to xn, det phi is non-zero if and only if phi preserves linear independence, which is equivalent to invertibility. So the determinant function determines invertibility of a linear transformation with a single number. Intuitively, this result tells us that a linear transformation of an n-dimensional space is invertible if and only if it maps an n-dimensional volume to another n-dimensional volume, and not to a volume of lower dimension. In fact, this intuition suggests another intuition, that the rank of a linear transformation is just the highest dimensional volume that it preserves, in the sense of mapping to another volume of the same dimension and not lower dimension. We can make this intuition precise in the following way. Fix a basis v1 to vn of v. Let i be an ordered set of indices i1 through im 
between 1 and n. To find the linear map iota i from fm to v by iota i of ej equals vij, where the e's are the standard basis vectors. In the other direction, define the linear map pi i from v to fm by pi i of vij equals ej and pi i of vk equals zero for k not in i. Then we have a theorem. The rank of phi is just the largest size of sets i and j for which the determinant of the composite pi j after phi after iota i is non-zero. The statement of this result is a little ugly because it's talking about coordinates relative to a fixed basis. Rank and volume are geometric concepts which don't depend upon a basis, so this is really just an artifact of the presentation. However, it's probably the simplest way to state the result with the tools we have available in this video. Nevertheless, the intuition behind the result is simple, and it shows how determinants can be used to characterize rank. Another important property of the determinant function is that it is multiplicative. The determinant of a product, that is, a composite, psi after phi, is equal to the product of the determinants of psi and phi. Indeed, by definition of det psi phi, for any vectors x1 to xn, we have det psi phi times delta of x1 to xn equals delta of psi phi x1 to psi phi xn, which by definition of det psi, equals det psi times delta of phi x1 to phi xn, which by definition of det phi equals det psi times det phi times delta of x1 to xn. The result now follows since delta is non-zero. This result shows that if phi scales volume by alpha and psi scales volume by beta, then the composite psi after phi scales volume by beta times alpha, which is very intuitive. In particular, if phi is invertible, then the determinant of phi inverse times the determinant of phi is the determinant of phi inverse times phi, which is the determinant of the identity transformation, which we know is 1. So the determinant of phi inverse is 1 over the determinant of phi, which is just the multiplicative inverse of the determinant of phi. This shows that if phi scales volume by alpha, then phi inverse scales volume by alpha inverse, which again is very intuitive. To make things simpler for a moment, suppose that v is r3. Fix any vector v and define a by a of xy equals delta of xyv. Then a is a two-dimensional determinant function on r3. Indeed, it is obviously multilinear and alternating, since delta is. This tells us intuitively that measuring volume relative to a fixed vector provides a way to measure area. Here's how it works. Fix any vector v. Now let x and y vary in any plane through the origin. To determine the area of the parallelogram determined by x and y in that plane, just compute the volume of the parallelopiped determined by x, y, and v, and assign that number as the area. The function you get from this procedure satisfies all of the properties of an area function. Up to a scalar multiple, it's the only possible area function on that plane. Moreover, every two-dimensional determinant function on R3 is obtained from delta in this way, as we saw in the previous video. So intuitively, this is the only way to measure area in space. Now let's introduce phi into the mix and define a phi by a phi of xy equals a of phi x phi y, which equals delta of phi x phi y v. So here we're transforming the vectors x and y using phi before measuring volume relative to v. Since phi is linear, a phi is also a two-dimensional determinant function on R3. From the previous slide, we know that there is a unique vector v prime with a phi of xy equal to delta of xy v prime for all vectors x and y. Notice here phi does not appear on the right-hand side. V prime is the vector relative to which a phi measures volume without transformation of x or y. We write v prime as adj phi of v for reasons we'll see in a moment. So adj phi is a map from R3 to R3, which sends any vector v in this construction to its corresponding vector v prime. Putting all this together, we obtain delta of phi x phi y z equals delta of x y adj phi z for all vectors x, y, and z.
It follows from this identity that adj phi is a linear map uniquely determined by phi. And everything we've done here in R3 generalizes. So again, let V be an n-dimensional vector space over the field F. Let phi be a linear transformation of V. Then the adjoint of phi is the linear transformation adj phi of V, satisfying delta of phi x1 to phi xn minus 1 xn equals delta of x1 to xn minus 1 adj phi of xn, for all vectors x1 to xn. Notice in this identity how the n minus 1 phi's on the left-hand side become the single adj phi on the right-hand side. This property uniquely characterizes the adjoint. This adjoint should not be confused with the adjoint of a linear transformation in an inner product space, which is a different thing. To avoid confusion, the adjoint defined here is sometimes called the classical adjoint, or the adjugate, or the adjunct. But in this video, we're just going to call it the adjoint. Suppose now that delta of x1 to xn equals 1. Then from the previous definition, it follows that adj phi of x is the sum seen here, where x appears in the ith position of delta. If you're feeling adventurous, you should pause the video to verify this. This formula allows you to compute the adjoint should you ever need to. An important theorem about the adjoint is that the composite adj phi after phi equals det phi times the identity transformation, which also equals the composite phi after adj phi. We only prove the first equality to illustrate. Taking xn equal to phi x, we obtain from the definition of adj phi that for all vectors x1 to xn minus 1, delta of x1 to xn minus 1 adj phi phi x equals delta of phi x1 to phi xn minus 1 phi x, which by definition of det phi equals det phi times delta of x1 to xn minus 1 x which by multilinearity of delta equals delta of x1 to xn minus 1 det phi times x. The first equality in the theorem now follows since delta is non-zero. From this theorem, we see that it's possible to compute the determinant of phi from phi and its adjoint. Also, if phi is invertible, then phi inverse is adj phi over det phi. For these reasons, the adjoint is theoretically important and leads to a number of classical results about the determinant although there are more efficient algorithms to compute determinants and inverses in practice. As a final word on the adjoint, we note that the adj mapping itself is multiplicative. That is, the adjoint of a composite, psi after phi, is equal to the composite of the adjoints of psi and phi, but in reverse order, the adjoint of phi after the adjoint of psi. The proof is similar to others we've already seen. By definition of adj psi phi, for any vectors x1 to xn, we have delta of x1 to xn minus 1 adj psi phi xn equals delta of psi phi x1 to psi phi xn minus 1 xn, which by definition of adj psi equals delta of phi x1 to phi xn minus 1 adj psi xn, which by definition of adj phi equals delta of x1 to xn minus 1 adj phi adj psi xn. The result now follows since delta is non-zero. Moving on, let v1 be a subspace of v. Recall that if phi maps v1 into itself, there are induced subspace and quotient transformations phi1 on v1 and phi bar on v mod v1, making this diagram commute, where the arrows from v1 to v represent the canonical injection and the arrows from v to v mod v1 represent the canonical projection. This diagram just says that phi 1x equals phi x for all x in v1, and phi bar x bar equals phi x bar for all x in v, where the bars denote projection. We have a theorem. The determinant of phi equals the determinant of phi 1 times the determinant of phi bar. This tells us that if phi scales volume within a stable subspace by alpha and within the quotient space by beta, then phi scales volume in the whole space by alpha times beta. As an example, in R3, if phi scales area within the xy plane by 2 and scales length along the z-axis by 3, then phi scales volume by 6. It follows that if phi 1 is a linear transformation of v1 and phi 2 is a linear transformation of v2, then the determinant of the direct sum of phi 1 and phi 2 
equals the determinant of phi 1 times the determinant of phi 2. To see this, let v be the direct sum of v1 and v2, and let phi be the direct sum of phi1 and phi2. Then this square commutes, where the isomorphisms are induced by the canonical projection. It follows that the determinant of phi2 equals the determinant of phi bar, so the result is a consequence of the previous theorem. Finally, we note that if phi and phi star are dual linear transformations, then their determinants are equal. Intuitively, dual transformations are like mirror images of each other, so they scale volume by the same amount. For much more information about dual transformations, be sure to check out my other video on duality in linear algebra. There is still much more to say about determinants. In future videos, I plan to cover more. Here are the references I used in making this video. Thanks for watching.